Hey man, well thanks for coming. Uh, apparently I brought the uh, Northwest weather with me. So, but actually the Northwest weather was 115 degrees when we left. So I don't know how that works out. But anyway, I appreciate uh, being invited out to preach. And I appreciate Pastor Anderson. He's a good friend of mine, Brother Corbin. And I thank you all for coming. And uh, tonight I'm preaching about redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14. It says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much uh, for this great camp and all these people who come and hear your word. And I just pray, Lord, you fill me with your spirit and uh, help me to preach the message you put on my heart tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, when the Bible says that we walk, should walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, that word circumspectly um, is basically like the, the nearest synonym would be like prudent or cautious. And circumspect actually implies, though, a careful consideration for um, of all circumstances and a desire to avoid mistakes and bad consequences. So God's saying, hey, we need to look around and, and see and perceive uh, mistakes that we might make and try to avoid those things. And God wants us to look circumspectly. He wants us to not be as fools, but as wise. And, and part of that is redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now, a lot of people, I, probably most people would say that they're saved in this audience here. And I would just submit to you that some of you are saved at an early age. So this message is for everybody. And we need to understand that our time on earth is not very long. And kids, you don't really see things the way adults do. When you turn 46, you'll understand. When, when you start to get older, you get start, start to get the aches and pains and things like that. Um, you'll, you'll understand that time is a fleeting thing. And we only have so much time to work for the Lord and do things for the Lord. And then it's just gone. You know, you know, we don't, we don't attain to the age of people in the beginning, like Adam, you know, to live to be 912 years old. And, you know, we don't live that long. We're actually only promised. We're not even promised that three score and 10. That's the average age or what, you know, that we would live. But God wants us to not be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. He wants us to redeem the time. And so Christ has redeemed us as saved people. And that means he bought us back, right? So we need to buy back some time. And you're like, well, I'm young. I, I got all my life to serve the Lord. Or maybe you're thinking, hey, I can uh, make my riches now. And then later on, I'm going to serve the Lord. But see, we don't always understand that our, we're, we're, uh, we, we can be damaged. We could be sick and not be able to serve the Lord. That could happen next week. We don't know uh, what our life's going to be like from day to day. And I think sometimes people get the idea that we can, we're just going to be serving the Lord till we're 99 years old and you're going to knock that last door and then die or something. <laughs> That's just not how it works. You know, we, we don't know. And so we should serve the Lord now while we have the strength. We should Man. serve the Lord with all of our might, um, till the day till the day we die, if we can. But as you'll see in this sermon, that's not always going to be the case. So, um, so turn to First uh, Corinthians chapter seven, verse twenty nine, and the Bible has this theme uh, uh, multiple times throughout the scriptures. I'm going to show you several different places where God's telling us, "Hey, we need to focus on things like thinking about what we're going to do with our time. What we do with our time is very important because I'll tell you what." I'm 46 years old, and I've been saved for 20 years, 21 years. And uh, there's some times I wish, some time I wish I could buy back, even as a saved person. And not everybody gets saved at the same time. If you're a child, you got a lot of serving the Lord. You can do a lot of uh, great things you can do for God because it's not just about rewards; it's about serving the Lord and pleasing Him. So the rewards are are just something the cherry on top that we get in heaven, and I'm not saying we shouldn't try to get rewards, we should try to get rewards, but uh, who are we ultimately trying to please? We're trying to please the Lord, right? 
1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29 says, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives, that have wives be as though they had none. So Paul's saying here that, you know, we need to realize that the time is short. We don't have a lot of time to do the things that we want to do for the Lord. We think we do, but in reality, we just don't know. From day to day, we don't know how, mu how much time we have on this planet. We don't know how much time we have to serve the Lord, so we need to redeem the time and think circumspectly. Turn to Psalm chapter 90, verse 1. Psalm chapter 90, and verse number 1. Now, this psalm is actually written by Moses. It's attributed to Moses. Psalm chapter 90, verse 1. And Moses had a long life that he lived, and he had a good life. He was a great man of God. But uh, listen to what he says in Psalm chapter 90, verse 1. It says, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. See, God is from everlasting to everlasting. He has ultimate time to do whatever he wants, but we don't. It says, Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men, for a thousand years is in thy sight, are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. So God, to, to God, time is, it, it, it goes by way differently than it does for us. It says, and it says in verse 5, Thou carriest them away as with a the flood. They are as asleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We are spent, we, excuse me, we spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. And this is what I'm trying to, to get you to understand here is that our, you know, he's, he's saying our, our years of our life are three score and ten, and if by reason of strength, they'd be four score years. So that's 80, right? Yet is their strength labor and sorrow. When you're 80 years old, you're not exactly the most spry person in the world anymore. You know, you're, you're not uh, a gang busting and, and just doing all these works for God. Now, obviously, there's an exception to the rule. Some people can be 80 years old and still serving God with all their might. And, and that happens. But, you know, as we get older, we start to slow down and we're not going to be able to do the things that we could do when we were younger. So when is the time to redeem the time? The time is right now. The time is right now to, to redeem the time. If you're saved, do all that you can for the Lord because, you know what, when you're 80 years old, it's not going to be as easy. It, and it's, it's going to you know, it says, yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow for it is soon cut off and we fly away. So most people don't live past this. Now, obviously, uh, people can live um, older than 80. My grandfather is 95 years old right now. But you know what? He's not uh, doing the things that he used to do. He's slowed down. He's barely, you know, he's taking a lot of naps. And, you know, he's just, he's not as, as there as he used to be. So we need to understand that we might be saved, but when we're 80, that doesn't mean that we're going to have superpowers or something. We're still going to be just like anybody else for the most part as far as physically goes. And so we need to understand that we're, we don't have the time that you think you have. So it says, so teach us to number our days, verse 12, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. So we need to understand that our days are limited, and so we need to apply our uh, day, you know, apply our hearts unto wisdom. And what's wise? Going out and serving the Lord, redeeming the time. It says, Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. It, it's good to be saved when you're young, you know? And it says, Satisfy us early with thy mercy. You know, it's, it's good to get saved at an early age. Now, I didn't get saved till I was 25 years old. So I got a lot of time to make up for. 
And so here I am, 46 years old. I didn't get into the ministry basically until I was 42. I've been a pastor for almost three years now. But I, I, I would like to go back and do things a little bit differently and have a more, um, you know, I've been getting people saved since I got saved. But like, there's just a lot of things that I wish I could go back and redo. A lot of things I could go back and rethink. And, and I, I want to get this across to you that you don't have as much time as you think. And we need to redeem the time. Look at verse 17. It says, and thy beauty, uh, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. And establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. So we want to um, have our work, the work of our hands be established by the Lord. And, and we do that by working for him. Isaiah, I'm going to have you turn to Philippians chapter 3, but I'm going to read for you Isaiah 43, verse 18. Isaiah 43, verse 18 says, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. So we're not, we're not supposed to live our life looking back on the former things. So now I just told you that I, I wish I could go back and, and, and do some things differently. But I don't, what I'm saying, I don't dwell on that, though. There is things I wish I could do. But now is the time for me to look forward. You know, as a pastor, I want to do the most I can do. I want to send the most uh, people out to go soul winning and get people saved. And I want to evangelize in all these different countries around the world and you know i want to do i want to start churches i want to do all these things but I, to me i just think it would have been a little easier when i was 25 years old right but see i didn't get saved till then so you know it, it just it depends on what age you get saved as to you know how you know obviously the works you can do so if you're young you can do a lot more works than i've ever done in my life you can do a lot of great things for god and, and look teenagers you can go out and win souls just like everybody else can you know, young children can go out and get people saved just like anybody else can. And, you know, I didn't start getting people saved till I was 25. So think if you're 14, you know, or you're 15, you can do way more things than I did before I was 25. And so, but sometimes people don't take things seriously. Sometimes people don't take their Christianity seriously. And we need to think about those things. And like I said, young kids don't really think about dying you know, a lot. They don't think about how fast their life is going to go. But I've been married for 20 years also. And so that has gone by really fast. And my children are all grown up and pretty much I got one child left living with me. And uh, it goes fast. So, um, you know, and obviously kids, you're, you, know, you go a long ways before you have to think about that. But, you know, we should be thinking about what we can do, what we can accomplish in our life by the redeeming the time and doing things now. You now, we can't put things off. When you put things off, it's just, you're, you know, you say, well, five years from now, I'm going to start soul and I'm really going to get serious about the things of God. And then five years later, you, you haven't, you're not going to do it. You know, you got to start doing things right now. Right now, don't put it off. Look at Philippians 3, verse 7. It says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, is the Apostle Paul talking he said, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. When the Apostle Paul got saved, he was barnstorming. He just shot out of the gate and just worked till the day he died, basically, or at least till we, we see him at the end of the book of Acts, you know, he's... He's still getting people saved. People are still coming to him and getting saved. And he, he just, did, he turned the world upside down for Christ. And he, you know, he, he learned a lot of things. He, he had a lot of knowledge, but he said he counted them but dung. You know, so the things, the worldly things that we learn, they're, they're going to help you in your daily life. But when he's talking about is, is like the religious things that he learned before, obviously, and, and, and his status and things like that. But those things don't matter. You know what mattered to Paul? getting people saved, turning the world upside down for Christ, and redeeming the time that he had. So he only had, you know, you only have a certain amount of time to do the works that you're going to, the great works that you're going to do. And it says, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is by the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, which is of God by faith. 
that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. The Apostle Paul is very serious about, uh, about redeeming the time and doing great works for God. Look at verse 12. It says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend. Now, what does that word apprehend mean? Well, when you think about being apprehended by the police, you did something wrong, you're apprehended. Well, you know, when we get saved, it's, we're kind of appreh we're apprehended by Christ, you know, and it says that I may apprehend for which also I am apprehended of Christ. Brethren, I count myself to, uh, or not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. So the Apostle Paul, he's like, I don't care about all that stuff that I used to do. Here's what I care about now. I care about redeeming the time and apprehending, reaching forth to those things, you know, not, not uh, uh, reaching forth unto those things uh, which were before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And you know what? As a Christian, we should always be pressing towards the mark, some kind of goal in our Christian life. And so you think about like pressing towards a mark for a prize um, of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Well, um, you know, there's a lot of things that we can press toward in our, in our Christianity. How about, you know, when you think of a mark, it's like a goal that you're setting for yourself, right? So I press toward that mark. I press towards that goal that I have. What about like reading your Bible once every year? You know, that's a good goal to have, right? And, you know, you press toward that mark. You, you try to hit the goals that you're supposed to hit every day. And you want to press towards that mark. But not just to do it one time. You know, there's a high calling in Christ Jesus. It's not just read your Bible one time and put it to the side. It's read your Bible over and over and over again so you can learn God's word. Because, you know, obviously when we get to heaven, we're going to have all this knowledge. And we're going to have a lot of Bible knowledge. But what about getting through your life right now? You know? The more Bible you know, the more Bible, you know, you, you can apply to your life, the better off your life is going to be right. if you apply it to your life. Now, you can read a lot of Bible and just not do what it says, and then it's not really going to help you very much. But, you know, if you apply it and you use it to press towards that high calling of God in Christ Jesus, you're going to be very successful in life. Now, there's a lot of things that we can do to press towards the mark. Now, I, I always try to think of it in sports uh, things. It's, it helps me because I used to be into sports. So, I mean, you think about a full-court press. You know, what, is, what, is hap what happens in basketball in a full-court press? If you don't know anything about basketball, it's okay. I'll help you out here. So, in a full-court press, you're trying to pressure the team to make a mistake and steal the ball and score. That's the prize. You want to score points, right? So, if you think about it like this, like in our Christianity, we want to press – you know, it, it, that's, it, it indicates pressure. You know, put some pressure on yourself every once in a while. We shouldn't just be like lackadaisical and just like, yeah, if I learn it, I learn it. If I, you know, if I go soul winning, I go soul winning. If I learn the verses, I learn the verses. We shouldn't be like that when it comes, you know, what are we talking about here? Redeeming the time, you know. Start doing things while you have the time to do it right now. You know, you, maybe you, you get older and you go blind, can you read the Bible then? You know, that's what I'm saying is like, you don't know what a day is going to bring forth. You don't know what's going to happen in your life. You don't know if you're going to be able to walk to go soul anymore. There was a time when we were doing the mega marathon and a guy had had surgery and I had to wheel him in a wheelchair literally to every single door. He wanted to go soul winning. He wanted a partner. I was like, all right, well, I'll just wheel you around. <laughs> but think about if you had some kind of terrible accident happen and you can never go soul winning again without someone pushing you around. I mean, we should go soul winning while we can go right now. Amen. Amen. Turn to James chapter 4, verse 13. James chapter 4, verse 13. And the Bible warns us about having this kind of a, an attitude where we just think we know what's going to happen the next day. We think we know what's going to be like two, two days from now, four days from now, two months from now, two years from now, three you know, whatever, 20 years from now, we don't know what it's going to be like even the next day. So we shouldn't be thinking, well, hey, you know, I'll serve God in my later years. I'm going to serve God 
you know, after I get married and I get the good job and all this stuff, you just don't know what's going to happen. Look at James 4.13. It says, go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanish away, vanisheth away. What is your life? It's a vapor. What is it? What's a vapor? It's just like a little bit of smoke, you know? So think about this. You know, you're, you're cooking food and you see that vapor go up. That's what God's, a, he's, make, he's trying to help you understand your life is so short in the grand scheme of things, it is like a vapor. I mean, God is outside of time and time is, is different for him. But for us, our life is like a vapor, okay? And a vapor, you know, you can even have like a campfire, right? You got the campfire right here. The smoke goes up for a certain amount of time. But when that smoke goes out or when that fire goes out, there's no more smoke. And how long does it take for a campfire to burn out, right? I'm, I'm uh, representing, uh, you know, too late reprobate tonight. So <laughs> that's my favorite camping shirt. But anyway, so, <clears throat> but think about that. I mean, what, whereas you, you, know, you know not what shall be on the morrow. What's the Bible saying? You don't know what it's going to be like tomorrow. You have no idea. And so what should our attitude be about? Or what should it be like? Verse 15, it says, For that you ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not to him it is sin. If you know that you're supposed to be serving God now, if you know you're supposed to be going soul winning now, if you know you should be reading your Bible now, if you know that you should be praying every day now, then that's what you need to do. If you're not doing it, it's sin. Isn't that what it says? So if you're rejoicing in your boastings and saying, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to make this money, I'm going to do all this, I'm going to get the wife, I'm going to do all this stuff, I'm going to have kids, and then I'm going to serve the Lord more than you, the Bible's saying, don't have that attitude. The Bible's saying that your life is a vapor. You don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next. So the time to serve the Lord is now. Turn to Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter number 27. I'll show you um, a very spirit. I, I believe he was a spiritual man. He was one of the patriarchs. Genesis 27 and, and I'll just prove to you that not everybody at the end of their life is always going to be spiritual. Even the mo some of the most spiritual people in the Bible aren't necessarily doing something spiritual at the end of their lives. Look at Genesis chapter 27. Verse number one, it says, And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his eldest son, and said unto him, My son. And he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold, now I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out to a field and take me some venison. So it's a pretty spiritual thing that he was thinking about there, right? I'm about to die. Hey, why don't you just go out and get me some of this savory meat? It says, and make me savory meat, such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. So here's Isaac saying, I don't know when I'm going to die, but hey, Go out and get me some of this meat before I die, right? And so, Isaac, do you think Isaac was a spiritual guy? Does anybody think Isaac was a spiritual guy? But look, in the end of his life, what's he, what's he doing? He's sending his son that is not exactly a super spiritual guy to go get him some meat, right? And he's blind. So here's what I'm saying is that you don't know what position your life is going to be at the time that you're, you're older, I mean, don't you think going soul winning blind is a lot harder than going when you can see? Don't you think going soul winning when you can walk is a lot better than when you can't walk? Don't, I mean, so what I'm saying is that when you're older, you just don't know what condition you're going to be in. You don't know what condition you're going to be when you're younger. You know, things happen to people all the time that take them out of commission to being able to do things to the best of their ability. So, like, you think about, like, an athlete that gets hurt. You know, sometimes athletes get hurt, and they're never the same again. They blow a knee out, 
or they injure themselves to the point where they can't play or do whatever sport that they're doing anymore, you know, and, and they can't, they, they don't think about things, you know, everybody thinks that they're always just going to be this young and this spry and all you kids sitting here, you know, you, you, you don't think about those things, but all it takes is one time you fall down and hurt your knee and, and you might not be able to walk right again. So, but uh, look what, look what happens here with Isaac. It says, and Rebecca heard that Isaac, uh, Isaac spake to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt for venison to bring it in. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Isaac, or excuse me, unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory meat that I may die and bless thee before the Lord, uh, before the Lord, before my death. So what is Isaac trying to do? He's trying to bless the son that really isn't supposed to be the blessed one. So is that really super spiritual? My point is that you don't know how spiritual you're going to be at those certain times. When you, people, you know, a lot of times when people get older, they get soft and they get backslidden, you know, and I, I'm, I'm hoping that I never get to that point, but you know, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. So, you know, I, I do want to take what the Bible says and apply it to myself and just be like, Hey, I can't slow down. You know, I'm going to slow down eventually, but I want to speed up until I can't go anymore. You know, I want, I want to still be able to go soul winning. I still want to be able to read the Bible while I can, you know, because you don't know. You're going to, you know, you lose your sight. I don't know how fast I can learn Braille, but if I lost my eyesight tomorrow, I'm glad that I've read the Bible multiple times, you know, but there's some people that are Christians that grow up and they never read the Bible, not even one time when they can see. So look at Genesis chapter 47. Look at Genesis chapter 47. The Bible says in Genesis 47, And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? Very interesting question, right? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, This is after Jacob has already had his children. He's come back to he's come to Egypt because of this big famine. And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are in hundred and thirty years. So he, he's a pretty old guy, right? Most of us, I don't think any of us here are probably going to live to be 137 years old. But look what he says. Few and evil have the days of my years of my life been. Isn't that a weird thing to say for someone that's 137 years old? Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my father's in the days of their pilgrimage. What's he saying? My father's lived to be a lot older than I do. And look, we're here at the end of time, and we're not living as long as even Jacob even wanted to. Here's the thing that's really important for you to understand, and, and this comes from <clears throat> a poem from a guy named C.T. Studd. <clears throat> it says, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I'm dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has been burned out for thee. And, you know, like I said, flames burn out. And we're, we only have a certain lifespan on this planet. And, you know, if you think about Jacob, here's, a, here's an interesting fact about Jacob, too, is that he wrestled with the angel of the Lord all night. And then for the rest of his life, he had what? He had a limp, didn't he? So, you know, could you see how one thing in your life can hinder you from doing the work of the Lord. If you have a, a bad, gimpy hip for the rest of your life, you know, it, it can slow you down. It can make you, uh, you know, have a hard time going so on. It can make, you know, we, the, as our life gets older, we get all these aches and pains and little things that, that start to bother us. And, you know, you're not going to be as efficient as when you're young and spry. So don't you think the best time to redeem the time is now when you're when you're youthful. And hey, I'm not saying just give up if you're old, okay? <laughs> I'm not saying that at all. Um, you know, but again, we're not going to be as productive as we get older um, as far as going out and getting this work done that we need to do. Because so, let's face it, soul winning is a hard job. You know, it's, it's hold. I mean, it's hard um, when it's cold. It's hard when it's hot. It's hard when it's just moderate temperature. It's hard work because, you know, sometimes you can walk 
six city blocks or whatever and not get anybody that wants to talk to you. You know, and, and the times when they're good is when every, every person gets saved or, you know, you, you only have to walk a little ways. Those are good days, right, when you can just knock a few doors and get all those people saved. You know, if you, if you want to incorporate your exercise program into your soul winning, then I guess it's good to go to unreceptive areas. But uh, <laughs> it's not always the most fun thing, especially you folks that live in the desert when it's, you're walking all these miles and it's 115 degrees outside or whatever. So... Ecclesiastes chapter 12, um, you know, I, I want to give you, before I end here, I just want to give you some things that we have little bits of time to do and things that you need to think about when it comes to redeeming the time. And so things that we have little time to do would be, so turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. We have little bit of time to fear the Lord and keep his commandments. And you say, well, that's kind of a weird thing to say. Well, you know, that's the whole duty of man. Look what it says in Ecclesiastes 12, 13. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So we, don't, we only have a certain amount of time to get on God's program and do our best to fear him and keep his commandments. And let's just face it, when you first get saved, you know, you're, you don't know everything. You know, it takes time to learn the things to discern between good and evil. It, it takes some time, and you're going to screw up. And even as a saved person that's been saved a long time, we all screw up. We all mess up. We all fall down on the job sometimes. But we only have a certain amount of time to do that. And, and look, the more we keep God's commandments, the more blessed our lives are going to be, and the better we're going to be in standing with God. He wants us to keep his commandments. He wants us to fear him. We don't want to live a life where we're just getting smacked all the time. Do you? Because, you know, when God, when, when you know what God expects from you and you just continue to not do it, it's going to be a rough life, just like Moses was talking about in Psalm chapter 90, right? So we need a, another thing that we have little time to do is soul winning. You know, I've been mentioning it a lot in this sermon, but... We love the thought of saying that we'll soul win till our final breath. We love the thought of saying, you know, like I said earlier, you know, oh, I'm going to knock this last door. Oh, and then you just give up the ghost and like, I died soul winning. We, th we like to think of those things, but it's just not reality. Most of, the, most of the time you see people die in the Bible that are like old saints. They're what? They're in bed. They're, their eyes are dim. You know, they're not knocking the last door, okay? That's not how it works. So we have a limited amount of time to do the things we do. You know, you get saved, you learn how to go soul winning, and then you have that certain amount of time where you're kind of in the prime of your life. When you're older, when you're 80 years old, you know, how many, how many 80-year-olds do we have knocking doors at our churches? How many? Would you, how many would you say we have? Zero. Thank you. Zero. And you know why? Because most 80-year-olds don't feel like going out in the 115-degree weather and knocking doors. You feel like laying around and, you know, taking some Advil or something, you know? So <laughs> I'm just saying, like, you know, yes, we should work for the Lord for our whole lives. But, you know, we need to redeem the time and do it while it's the best time of our lives, the primes of our lives, the early times in our lives, because... You know, you say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve the Lord later on. But you might not be. You might be blind. You might not be as spiritual. You know, you might be halt on your hip, you know, <laughs> where you can't get around as much as you used to. You know, if you're in a wheelchair, you're not going to be knocking the top doors on the triple-decker apartment buildings, are you? You're going to have to have someone wheeling you around and doing it. And let me tell you something. It was hard pushing that, that guy around all day, but it made me think about, you know, our mortality because God, you know, we're, we're, God gives us a shelf life. He gives us a certain amount of time that we can work in between. The Bible says in Proverbs eleven thirty, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that winneth souls is wise. He that winneth souls is wise. So what, what does the Bible say that we're supposed to... Uh, we're supposed to look circum we're supposed to have a circumspect wisdom. So we need to think about the fact that, hey, we need to win souls now while we can. 
We need to win souls while we're able and spry and, and, our, and our knowledge and our mind is sharp. Because here's the other thing, your mind might not work the same as it did when you were younger, you know? And so we, we basically have a shelf life. So, um, you know, and the first problem is our start date for soul winning. You know, when, when was your start date? You know, a lot of people like to say, well, you know, well, we have gravestones and they have like a date, you know, the date you were born, the day you die, right? If people can even afford gravestones anymore, but that's another subject for a different time. But um, you have a dash right there. But you, that whole dash isn't always used to serve the Lord, is it? You only have a certain amount of time to actually serve the Lord when you're not super old or when you're not too young to get saved. The dash isn't really, you can't always fit a lot of good works into those da- into that dash. And sometimes people are just too lazy to do it or they're not thinking circumspectly or they're not redeeming the time. So we need to understand that that's not the case. Here's the other thing. So thinking we have things we have little time to do. We only have a little time with our children. We only have a certain amount of time with our children. And I, and I brought up the fact that I have all my kids are out of my house. Pastor Anderson's like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> but it's not, you know, when you get to that point, though, there's this like stage you hit. And I'm just trying to help you out. There's a stage you hit where you're like, man, it'd be so nice to have all my kids back in my house again. It'd be so nice to hear them crying again. And you know what I mean? So like what I'm trying to say is that you need to redeem the time with your children too. Don't just put them on the back shelf. Don't just put them on the back burner and say, you know what? I'm going to spend time with my kids when, when I'm older. <laughs> they might, they're not going to want to spend time with you when they're older. They want to spend time with you right now. And if you want to spend time with them when they're older, you better spend time with them right now so they know that you love them. And we need to redeem the time with our children, you know, you, you think, well, I just can't wait till I can go on vacation. My kids are all out of the house. You, you really won't feel that way. If you love your children, you won't feel that way. And so what I'm trying to tell you is that, re, you know, enjoy the time. You know, does it, is it hard when they're all sick at the same time? And it, and it seems like the, your world's crashing around you. And I just need a break. I just need a break. There's going to come a time when you're going to be like, man, I wish I could just have my kids all together with me again. And, and be young again, but we only get one chance to raise our children, only one chance. We only have this life, and we need to make sure that we can get them saved, and we need to make sure that we spend time with them and show them that we love them. We need to redeem the time with our children, and also our marriage. My wife always gets sad about this, but we only have this life with our wives and our, or our spouse, and so I, I see people struggle with their marriages. I see Christians struggle with their marriages, and I just think, man, you only have one life with them. Why not try your best to get along with them to the best of your ability? Fulfill your role as a spouse. I, I, it just it drives me nuts to see, uh, you know, and all spouses fight, right? All married couples fight to a certain extent. Um, you know, and I'm sure there's a diamond in the rough that they've never fought or whatever, but it's just not reality. But what I'm saying is that in heaven, we're not going to be married anymore. It's till death do us part. Actually, the, mo- the moment one of you dies, you're no longer married. So why not redeem the time now? Get along with your spouse now. Don't say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get along with her in 20 years because you know what? You might be divorced. <laughs> so we need to redeem the time with our spouses now. You know, when you get to heaven, you know, you, you're going to want to have built the best family that you could have. You know, and the most important thing is, you know, for us is to reach the next generation. You know, if your kids are just sitting there seeing you, just all you do is fight, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have an effect on them. So try your best to redeem the time now with your spouse because you only have this life to spend with them. And do you want to just have it spent in misery? And, I, and look, I, I preach about this a lot, and I say, look, the, the biggest problems I deal with are marriage problems. And it's, it's, I, I hate dealing with it. And that's why I'd like to just say this, that young, young people, don't just marry the first person that comes around. Don't just marry, like Pastor Anderson was preaching about, you know, don't just try to marry the Barbie doll, guys, because those Barbie dolls come with a price, <laughs> right? And it's called misery, right? 
So, <laughs> and I'm not saying I'm not saying all pretty girls are are, are hard cases, but because um, I got a pretty girl, or not. <laughs> but you know, I, look, you you need to go past the skin deep thing. You know, beauty is fleeting. All right, you're not going to be as pretty as you are 30 years from now. You're you're going to start getting wrinkled. Everybody starts to get uglier as they get older. No no offense. But it's just the truth. So we need to redeem the time with our spouses and get along with them now. You know, and for, and for your sake, for your sanity's sake, and for your children's sake also. But I mentioned Bible reading and pressing toward that mark. Now's the time to read your Bible and get all the Bible knowledge that you can so that you can help yourself have a better life. Redeem the time now for your Bible reading. Get it done now. Don't just wait and say, you know, 20, in 20 years, I'm going to read the Bible finally from cover to cover. I'll just learn all the stuff in Bible preaching. I guarantee you, you're not going to learn the knowledge that you need to know with just listening to Bible preaching. Right. Yeah, yeah. You need to crack this book open and read it. Yeah. And you should read it every day. Yeah. You know, and if you fail to read it one day, pick it up and read it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Get back on the horse. Yeah. Get back on your plan. Press towards that mark. Of the, of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, right? So, and, and here, what about prayer? Prayer is another thing that we need to redeem the time with. And I'll, I'll say this, that I think that prayer is probably a very underrated thing with people. You know, and acknowledging God when you wake up in the morning, that's a good thing to do. Acknowledging God and, and thanking him for the things that he does for you. You know, God does so much stuff for us that we, that we probably don't even thank him for. And... We forget to pray. And you know what? There's going to be a time where we, we don't pray anymore. There's going to be a time where we don't pray anymore where we don't have the privilege of prayer because we're going to be in heaven. We're going to be with God. But, you know, God keeps our prayers in a little vial, and he loves to look back on the memory of our prayers. And what, how big is your prayer vial? Is there anything in it? Is God, if God opened it up, would he be like, Oh, never mind. I'll put the, you know, here's the one time they thank me for dinner. Here's the one time, you know, they thank me for the birth of their child or whatever. You know, think about that because, you know, you know, we sing that song, "Sweet Hour of Prayer." You know, the very last stanza, you know, it says, you know, like I'll shout while passing through the air, farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. You'll wave or whatever as you're going up to heaven. You know, we, we won't always have that time of sweet hour of prayer, the time when, you know, we believed in God but couldn't see him. You know, God holds that as a high price. And, you know, how much are you talking to him? Have you, we, we need to redeem the time. If, you're not, if you don't have much of a prayer life right now, change. Start redeeming the time. Press toward that mark. Start praying to God now because there's going to come a time when you're in heaven and, like, we're, you know, I don't know. I don't think we'll be pr comparing prayer vials, okay? <laughs> I don't think it'll be that vain <laughs> in heaven. But, like, you're going to know how much you prayed. You know right now how much you actually prayed. Do you actually acknowledge God every day? Do you thank him for the things? Do you thank him for your food? You know, those are just simple things. And Christ gave us the example, and he would always thank God for his, for his food before. He'd, he'd pray and then break the bread, or he'd pray, hand out the bread. Or he'd pray, he would eat. And so those are things that we need to uh, redeem the time with. Redeem the time with prayer, Bible reading, our marriage, our, our, our raising our children, our soul winning, and our church attendance. You know, you can't get back the attendance that you missed last week. And, you know, as a pastor, I can't just miss church whenever I feel like it. You know, I can't just wake up on Sunday morning and go, I think I'll have somebody else pray, or preach for me this morning. You know, it's just not like that. But see, other people can do that. But d is that what you do? You know, we should redeem the time with our church attendance because you don't know what you're going to miss that day. You might miss the greatest sermon that was prepared for you that you never got to hear because you never were that you weren't there. And so we need to go to church more in 2021 than less, right? We need to redeem the time. So, you know, like I said, we get those two dashes between our dates, but in reality, once, it's once we get saved is when our Christian life starts. And that's when we should start pressing toward that mark. 
And, and, and you know, obviously, we're not always going to be on our A game, but we should try our best to redeem the time that we have right now. And when we walk around, we look circumspectly and think, hey, this might be a problem later on down the line. I need to think about this. You know, hey, I know that that lady's really pretty, but if I marry her, maybe she might turn into a nightmare later on. <laughs> you know, I mean, find someone spiritual. Find someone that loves the Lord like you do. Because if you're just like, well, she's Catholic, but, you know, she says she's Christian. You know, that's a stupid marriage to get into. If she's going to the United Methodist Church, and you're like, well, she's in a Christian church. So, look, I've seen that happen before, and it ends up in a tragedy. You don't want that to be your life. I mean, do you really want to be miserable for the rest of your life? Because that's what happens when you marry the wrong person, right? So, and again, we can't know what the state of our physicality is going to be in tomorrow, next week, two weeks from now. We don't know. And we don't know what our mental capacity is going to be like next week, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. We don't know. And so that's why it's so important that we live each day to our fullest in Christ and try to redeem that time. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. You want God to direct your paths? Well, acknowledge him in all your ways and don't lean on your own understanding. And, you know, you want God to direct your path? Redeem the time. And you know what? And acknowledge him in all of his way, in all your ways, and he will do that. All right, let's pray. Heavenly